So as I came in this evening, I think I'm a little hot, guys. Not me personally, Mike. <laughs> Just couldn't wait. Like that thing. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. So when I came in, Judy and Karen back there said, do a good job. So you all will have to be the judge when we're done here this evening. So welcome tonight to what I suppose and believe is our very first Blue Christmas event here at Community Church. That's to the best of my knowledge, and it, I could be wrong, but I mean, think that these types of events are important. As we think about life, and all of its losses in a season of the year when we're supposed to be happy and celebrating and filled with joy, we need some place to at least be able to pray about, to think about, to consider, and to share our losses, our hurts, our pains with one another. And I just have to say to you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, your presence is very important to me and to this service and to this church. Before I actually begin reading what I'm supposed to read, I also want to say a word of thank you to the prayer team and to Stephen Ministers, um, many of whom are sitting right over here. This group of very handsome men and beautiful ladies, uh, they have brought about the planning of tonight. So thank you all. I want to say a special thank you to Ted, who is taping us, and to Mike, who's running our sound. Thank you, gentlemen. And Paul is somewhere. Where's Paul? Paul, there's Paul. Paul, thank you for our music this evening. Your effort and time is greatly appreciated. And where? There's Mary. Um, and Robin, thank you for the refreshments that we will have afterwards. I have taste tested the punch, and it's outstanding. She would not let me touch a cookie. And I want to say a very special thank you uh, for all of us from, to a friend of mine, Mary Stover. Mary has worked tirelessly to make all of this happen. If this service is meaningful to you and it touches your heart, certainly God receives the greatest amount of benefit, but Mary Stover is right up there and should receive that benefit. So Mary, thank you uh, as well. Larry, I know you must have been so impressed by Mary when you two met because she does everything so very, very well. Mary, thank you. Now I've embarrassed her and she even does that well. So let us begin. Even though Christmas time is a season of great joy and light, for many of us it can feel heavy, almost like a season of darkness and shadows. The joy around us can accentuate the pain and loss we have carried. Sorrow, grief, and longing sometimes jolt up unexpectedly like crashing waves. Other times they feel more like a churning that persists even when celebration surrounds us. The purpose of this service is not to take the darkness away or minimize any pain but to reveal God's presence in the midst of it. This time set apart is a reminder that we do not journey alone. Tonight, our tears and our heaviness are not just accepted, but they are welcomed. After tonight, as the winter solstice ends, each day reveals more daylight. Although nearly imperceptible, every single day gets a little longer and each night shorter. We pray God works in our hearts in the same way, revealing God's light a little more each day, lessening the darkness and the shadows. Today we come together to acknowledge the tension of both and. The fact that joy and sadness exist together, birth and death exist in this life. Maybe you have come with family tonight, Maybe you have come alone. Maybe you are familiar with this room or maybe you came as a stranger. However you find yourself this evening, 
We are one community tonight with brokenness in common, and we welcome you to our time together. Maybe you're wondering if Jesus is real, if God is love, <clears throat> if there is any healing for your pain. Maybe you have come confidently, expecting God to meet you in your deepest heartache. We welcome you whatever you bring, however you feel, and the you that you are this evening. We invite you not to be strong tonight, not to be what you think everyone expects of you. We invite you to be honest, to be vulnerable, to be open to feel all the feelings. God promises to meet us right where we are and just as we are, as we welcome you here. There are no have-tos in this service, just invitations. You may sit, you may cry, you may sing, you may be quiet. Our prayer is simply that God meets you and me and all of us in the depths of our hearts this evening. Our first hymn is 211, and I believe there should be a hymnals under your pew seat or under the pew directly in front of you. And I invite you to stand if you are able. If you are not, you want to remain seated, that's perfectly fine. Number 211. Rejoice, rejoice. 
How about an unexpected butterfly? A timely song you haven't heard in years on your car radio. What about an unexpected test, text message or, or even a Christmas card? You're not even sure you remember who they were. Or maybe just a word spoken at just the right moment. So tonight, I ask you to meet God again in these kinds of moments. For He is always near in the past, the present, and always will be in the future. Personal moment. Her name was Millie Hefner. She sat right there, just two rows back from this elevated pulpit that I once served in Ohio. And Millie would be there 15 minutes early before worship, Bible open, having read the scriptures that we announced the week before, having her notebook already and the pen already clicked and poised and ready to jot down every thought perhaps even criticism of the young whippersnapper creature. My first Thanksgiving sermon was something decades ago, as I remember it, about being incompletely thankful. The concept being, we can be thankful, but there are more things to happen in our life and we can go to different depths and degrees and maturities of thankfulness no matter what happens to us. And Millie wasn't writing anymore. She closed her Bible. Hands for the first time around her face. Continued with my prepared thoughts, not knowing anything about it. And usually she at least greets me on the way out. I didn't see Millie. Was a little surprised when the following Monday morning she came into the office. I'd never seen her outside of Sunday without her Bible and her notebook open. And Millie came in and she was emotional. She wondered, how can a God want or need or have our thankfulness? Because you see, God just took my husband a few months ago. And we had just celebrated our 40th anniversary. And things were great, even though he didn't feel good that week. I didn't know then that in less than two months cancer would take him. And so I'm going to be here and say, no, no, I'm not thankful. As a matter of fact, new pastor, I'm not going to be around this coming Christmas season because I just can't take my first Christmas alone. And as she was leaving, she mentioned something about pigeons. She said, oh, why didn't God take his pigeons rather than my husband? Pigeons are dirty, noisy. They scratch, they squeal all night long when they're in the roost. And they were doing this because the husband in his semi-retirement had built a pigeon, a homing pigeon coop on top of their flat roof on the new addition that his success at DuPont Chemical uh, Company, and he was on the ground floor of the Teflon thing that you all may remember to see, and he was successful, and, and he wanted a new hobby, and so he, he put this new pigeon coop, homing pigeon coop, on the roof. She couldn't stand it. Why didn't God take the pigeons? Well, I offered to keep Millie at the top of my list that Monday and told her I'd do what I could to think about it. 
And so just within a few hours, I went to those big books that some of us pastors think we're smart and we want to look at. And I looked up the word. I didn't even know if pigeons was in the Bible. But I found it. And I read it and I said, this is perfect. This is going to fit. Thank you, God. In my incomplete thankfulness, I want to let Millie know. And so I picked up the phone. And I said, no. This is the kind of news you deliver in person. This is kind of news you need to deliver in a home, like a homing pigeon. So I did everything I could to wait at least two days. I didn't want to be over anxious. But in a couple of days, I did call her up and say, Millie, I'd like to come and see you, and we did. And I told her about pigeons. It's as if, like the apostle, scales fell from her spirit. And she was transformed in that moment. She went on. She knew how to maintain them, how to feed them. Her dying husband at least tried to teach her that much. But she completely changed. It became more than a hobby for her. As a matter of fact, within a year or two, she had raised that brood of pigeons to be ribbon-winning pigeons. And the number one pigeon was named Charlie after her husband. True story. My first, but not last. Blue Christmas experience. The scripture reading is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. These are the words of God for the people of God. Good evening. My name is Linda Roberts, and I'm going to be reading Isaiah 40, 1, chapter 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over all her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the God will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. I asked what I shout. Shout that the people are like the grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade. Beneath the breath of the Lord, and so it's with the people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops, shout it louder. O Jerusalem, shout, and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming.
Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with the powerful arm. See, he brings his reward from him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. Dear friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is number 230, A Little Town of Bethlehem. And again, if you are able and feel comfortable in standing, you are welcome to do so. If it's easier for you to remain seated, that's perfectly fine too. Do whatever makes you feel most at home. Yes, and, and those parishioners are a gift to us, that type of person as well. I remember when I was studying the Psalms in, in seminary, I, I was very interested to learn that there are two different types of songs that reflect the types of things we're talking about tonight. One is anger, a feeling of anger from the imprecatory Psalms, where we want God to do our enemies in. And of course, the other is that whole category of lament Psalms, which we don't often talk about in Christianity because we want everyone to be happy, but it doesn't always work out that way. Thank you, friend. Thank you. I will remember that story for quite some time. Thank you, Paul. 
Just before I begin reading tonight's meditation, I'm going to ask that those who are lighting the individual candles, please join me and be seated here in these seats or right there at this time. So y'all come. You can just move that stuff if you'd like. I'll have a few red sometimes. I was beginning to feel like nobody wanted to sit with me, but that's okay. So I'd like to read this to you. This is uh, a meditation on Advent, then and now. The season before Christmas is called Advent. It's a time when we remember the coming of Jesus on a dark night long ago. Today we've added gifts, trees, decorations, and cookies to the celebration. But generations ago, those who were waiting, hoping for a Messiah to appear, were living in a very dark time. The history of God's people was filled with fighting, exile, disappointment, slavery, and longing for a God who seemed to go silent. Isaiah 9 verse 2 describes them as people walking in darkness. Listen to the rest of the passage though. <clears throat> the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Later in the same chapter, we hear the promise of what that light will be like. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. One of the spiritual disciplines that I do and have successfully completed again this year is to listen to Handel's Messiah. And those words are very familiar to us if you know that beautiful piece of music as well as the text from Isaiah. If you are walking in darkness tonight, this story is your story. There is hope. The great light that came into the world is still here in our world. His name is Jesus. So I want to say to you that at this time in our service, we will begin lighting the individual candles and Austin will lead us in that first candle. And I'd like to read to this to you um, before Austin comes. And Mike, if you'll turn the lights down, please. Thank you, sir. As we continue, we invite you to sit for a time in darkness and silence. It may feel uncomfortable since we are so used to filling our time and mind with much noise and busyness. We invite you to acknowledge your loss, your doubt, your confusion. Whatever emotions surface, our prayer is that in the midst of any darkness around us, we feel the embrace of God, a God whose spirit is hovering ever near to us, a God who is present, maybe even more powerfully in our pain than in our joy. God's promise is that darkness will not last forever. Tomorrow the days begin to get longer. It's hardly noticeable at first, but as the days move by, Winter turns to spring and then to summer. We pray you experience the God of hope, the God who is the light in the darkness. After a time of silence, you will be able to come forward to light your own candle. You may want to name your sadness out loud to God. As you are lighting a candle, feel free to name a person, an event, an emotion, or say a word of prayer. After you light your candle, please return to your seat 
as we continue. This will take place immediately after the fifth candle is lit. As we light the first candle, we remember the family and friends we have loved and lost, whether recently or long ago, who are you missing tonight? Some we have loved no longer walk this planet because of sickness and death. Others are no longer present in our lives because of life changes, transitions, and broken relationships. We remember those we loved, their faces, their voices, their dreams, what they gifted us by knowing them. Lord, we thank you for all, for the gift of memories and for life itself. We are grateful that even in darkness, the light still shines and the darkness has not overcome it. Help us in times of unbelief and restore our hope. As we light the second candle, we think of the stuff of life we have lost, whether tangible or intangible. We counted on these things, our jobs, finances, homes, and health, loss of trust, hope, joy, and even our faith. As we remember these things, help us open our, our hands to release the grip on what we once had. God, we ask for peace and comfort in this place. Lord, we thank you for the gift of memories and for, for life itself. We are grateful that even in darkness, the light still shines and the darkness has not overcome it. Help us in times of unbelief and restore our hope. As we light the third candle, we remember ourselves. We remember the person we used to be, the person we became, and the person we are now. The memories bring a mix of emotions. Windows of joy and gratefulness are joined by sadness, hurt, pain, anger, and fear. Give us your compassion as we see our own failures and shortcomings. We accept that we are a work in progress and we long for healing. Help us be gentle with ourselves as we remember the past, acknowledge the present, and look to the future. Lord, we thank you for the gift of memories and for life itself. We are grateful that even in darkness, the light still shines and the darkness has not overcome it. Help us in times of unbelief and restore our hope.
As we light this fourth candle, we remember our hurting world. We think of those in our close community as well as those around the globe. We feel the heaviness of those who suffered tragedy, faced unimaginable injustices, or continue to live in war. We think of humanity and your very breath being in all of us. In our broken world, filled with pride, hatred, and self-preservation, we acknowledge that your light shines. Lord, we thank you for the gift of memories and for life itself. We are grateful that even in darkness, the light still shines and the darkness has not overcome it. Help us in times of unbelief and restore our hope. As we light the fifth candle, we remember the gift God has given us surrounding this very season, hope. You see, out of darkness, the light came, in the most unlikely of places, in an unexpected time, Jesus came. He didn't come to eliminate the darkness, but to shine in the middle of it. In the darkest of places, we remember that God walks with us, carries us when necessary, and never leaves us on our own. Lord, we thank you for the gift of memories and for life itself. We are grateful that even in darkness, the light still shines, and the darkness has not overcome it. Help us in times of unbelief and restore our hope. Now, I am sure that I stole someone's candle from the table. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, I was so zealous of making sure you guys had your candles that I forgot to get mine. Please forgive me, Deborah. That's okay. I appreciate it. <laughs> so before you head out to light candles, please light one. Before they head out to light the candles, I want you to take just a moment to look around. Because we all need a little bit of light, and I've got to the place in life where I need more light than I used to for reading to see, um, there's still some bright, still some light. But if this world were, were completely dark, we could not see one another or tell who the person sitting next to us. Um, Christmas Eve, we got a candle on the service here in this sanctuary. My favorite thing about that service is that as one light lights another light, lights another light, I can begin to distinguish the beauty of each person. And I have to tell you that everyone looks good in candle. <laughs> And so we are reminded, as we have read many times this evening, that as the light is shed abroad in the world, no matter how dark, no matter how difficult or hard this year has been, it's been very tough for many, many people. 
Many of us here this evening, even then, the darkness cannot be light. So I want to invite you to receive this light. Please always remember to dip the unlit candle into the lit candle. That way no one will be burdened by wax or harmed in the evening. And while we're doing that, I'm going to sing a song for us. It was written by a guy named Paul Stuckey, who was part of Peter, Paul, and Mary. I happen to know him personally. His wife was a chaplain in my New England prep school but years later on, but I did meet him on campus, and he sang this song, he made this song up between an old lady and a young boy who had no other family And then one Christmas Eve, they met. He called it Christmas Dinner. Goes like this. And it came to pass on a Christmas evening While all other doors were shuttered tight Outside standing a lonely boy child He was cold and shivering in the night On his street, through every window, save but one was gleaming bright. But through this window walked that lonely boy child. Oh 
Now, you are welcome to continue to hold your candle lit, but I think it's going to be hard to sing our closing hymn if you hold the candle in one hand and the hymnal in the other. But you probably know this song by heart, it's Away in a Manger. And I just want to point out another similarity, Paul, no Paul Studio's brother, Larry, was one of my seminary professors and a member of this annual conference, and a wonderfully, wonderfully kind man as well. So if you're able and you'd like to stand, you're welcome to do so. You're welcome to remain seated. You're welcome just to listen while you hold your candle and think about the light. Whatever you feel most comfortable in doing is perfectly fine. Oh, 
know, Jeff read for us that selection from Revelation 21. And Jeff, one of the wonderful verses of that selection is this, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So often we want to think of a God who is angry or judgmental, but actually we serve and love a God who is tender and kind and gentle. And I always think of that picture. That to me, every time I perform a funeral or do something that uses that text, that God comes personally to you and to me, to all of us. At those times in life that are sad and difficult, that are hard in which we struggle, in which tears are all too ready to come and wipes them away from our eyes. That's a great image, I think, of God. So I want to say to you a couple things as we come to the end of our service. First of all, thank you for being here. I have wanted to do this for about the last two, two and a half years, but something called COVID got in the way. And so I am so thrilled to see this actually happen. Again, Mary and all of you, thank you so very much for your help in leading this. You all have done a far better job than I would have. So thank you so much. And I also want to say to you that in the back center section are refreshments. Uh, there is some of the be best punch you can ever have and the cookies are even better. So please do stay if you'd like and if you can't stay, if you'd like to take something home with you, that's okay. We just want you to know that it's available for you and we invite you to be there to share in that. Please place your candles in the basket out this way, uh, sort of on the table as you enter and exit. Um, we'd like to use them again on Christmas Eve. And also we want you to know that there is on that table a prayer page for you and you are welcome to take one should you like to. So let us pray at this time. Our current world isn't God's perfect plan. Revelation gives us a beautiful picture of what God has in mind for us. A new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more need for tears. We invite you to visit the display with scripture cards as you exit. Please take one or two or any of the free literature that is in the back involving the, tonight's activity and or prayer. As God invites us to keep his word close to our hearts. If anyone feels overwhelmed with what life has brought their way and would like someone to talk to or to walk with through this journey, we have a group called Stephen Ministers. And would you please stand if you are a Stephen minister or Stephen leader? These are some of the best people you can meet. You guys can sit back down if you'd like. And they are willing to support you emotionally, personally, and spiritually. And now may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen. Please join us for refreshments when you are ready. Mm -hmm.